All right, I think we have critical mass. Eugene, you wanna get, just kick things off? Okay, so uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, today, to today's webinar. It's, it's sponsored by ABNI, the Asian American Bar Association of New York. So my name is Eugene Kim, and I am a part of the criminal defense practice at the Legal Aid Society. And I'm also part of Albany's pro bono committee. Uh, first off, uh, I wanna say a special thank you to the great people at Paul Weiss that have helped our organization with this event. And also a shout out to our wonderful co-chairs and volunteers of Albany's pro bono committee, because we can't forget about you all. So our presentation today will be a discussion of anti-Asian violence and hate arising from COVID-19 pandemic in New York City and what the rights of victims and bystanders are. If you have any questions, please send them in the chat box for those that are in Zoom right now viewing. Uh, we will have a short Q&A at the end if time permits, so um, be sure to get those questions in. Now, um, if you don't get to your questions, please drop a line at albanyclinic at gmail.com. That's A-A-B-N-Y clinic at gmail.com, or you can feel free to call our hotline at 516-690-7724. Now, um, so the Asian American community is the fastest growing population in the country. Um, the, in New York City, Asians make up approximately 15% of the population. And while we have seen us triumph in recent times, ranging from uh, critically acclaimed hit films to uh, greater representation across professions, we as Asians continue to be marginalized and discriminated against, and also continuously hurt by this concept of the model minority that uh, society has placed on us. And, and in reality, our community faces uh, many serious issues. The poverty level of Asians in the community is um, one out of four New Yorkers. Um, about half of Asian New Yorkers have limited English proficiency. Uh, one in four Asian New Yorkers ages 25 and over have never completed high school and many are not literate in their native language. 70% of Asian Americans are foreign born and 90% of Asians have at least one immigrant parent. 40% of all the deportation proceedings in New York City are Asians. So it is very important for us to continue providing resources to our community because there are many of us, of us that are in need and we must do what we can to help build up one another in our community. So we are all part of one another and uh, these are very real issues that affect us, those close to us and those that look like us. Now, in the light of the pandemic and the, the racist rhetoric of the man in the White House, there has been a significant upswing in violence in our city uh, when China was named as one of the originating sources of the COVID-19 virus. And unfortunately, we've all seen uh, these horrific videos and stories in the news online and um, on social media of Asians getting harassed and attacked in our city. And as a result, we don't feel safe in the city and that we help build and that we're an important part of. Um, with that being said, we have here today some prominent figures in our legal community to discuss what your rights are and when you yourself are placed in or when you are a witness of anti-Asian harassment and violence. So uh, let me uh, now turn to each of the panelists and have them provide just a few words to introduce themselves and to tell us about their work. So, um, uh, David, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, David Chang. I'm from uh, the Queens District Attorney's Office. I'm Section Chief in Community Partnerships. Um, I've been with the office 20 years as a prosecutor, uh, working in homicide and narcotics investigations for several years um, before coming over to Community Partnerships. So I've been in the office about 20 years. Uh, and I grew up in Queens and uh, represent the most one of the biggest Asian populations in the city, uh, not just the city and the country. We have uh, probably almost half a million Asians living in Boone County. And uh, it's very important, very important part of our strategy. Thank you, David. And uh, next we have Joe. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Gim. I'm a uh, deputy chief in Nassau County. Um, in the uh, County Court Bureau, which uh, handles felonies. Uh, I spent a large part of my career in the city system in Staten Island, and uh, I actually have uh, prosecuted an aggravated harassment case based on, uh, in that case, it was at the first um, 
uh, it was the first gay right, gay parade, gay rights parade in Staten Island. So uh, I've actually prosecuted one of these cases. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And then also we have uh, Julia. Hi, um, I'm Julia Kerr. I'm a private equity funds lawyer at Simpson Thatcher. Um, I grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and I've been in New York for um, a couple of years now. Okay, thank you to all our panelists for being here today. And um, David will uh, kick off our discussion. So uh, without further ado, you know, take it away. Okay, so um, really when we're talking about hate crimes and bias incidents, we really have to think about the law, um, obviously. And I think one of the biggest things there isn't a lot of clarity on the law amongst most people. Um, and so I'm gonna try and explain a lot of it. There is going to be a lot of legal deeds, but I'm cutting it down as much as possible so that everyone can really understand what we're talking about. Uh, give me a moment, I'm going to start sharing the screen. Okay, so the relevant statutes that we're talking about are going to be the New York State Penal Law, all right? The crime, New York Crimes Against Hate Crime, Laws Against Hate Crimes we really are in two places. We have uh, 240, 30, subsection 3, and then 4505, all right? Those are the penal law numbers. So if you're going to look them up, you're going to look that those sections up so you can understand them a little bit better. But we go through these pretty quickly, all right? Now, look, there is a lot of confusion because we have what we call biases and incidents, and we have things that we call hate crimes. Um, most of the things that have been there upset us are going to be biased incidents. Not all biased incidents rise to the level of hate crimes. The vast majority of them are not going to be hate crimes. What happens, so, if, for example, if someone, and, and uh, excuse the language, but we're going to have to be, uh, Joe Gann's going to mention how important that specific language is. But if, first, if a person goes, go back to China, you sing guy. Um, going, that is, that alone is not going to constitute a hate crime. It may be a bias incident, but it is not going to be a hate crime. Um, or another possible thing that might become, you know, like, you're going to a store, no one else is wearing a mask, but then when you do have to go in, the person in the door says, you can't come in here without a mask. All right? And so that's another possible, that, Another possible uh, bias incident, but not a hate crime. Right? Hate crimes generally require harm. Hey, Dave. Harm. Dave, you're, yeah. you're coming through pretty choppy. We're getting a, a lot of feedback that people can't understand what you're saying. Uh, is there? Is there? Could you possibly call in, possibly through a phone line, and then maybe we yeah. could uh, we could see you and then also hear you at the same time. Yes. Let me let me close. It. Hey David. Um, yes. Yeah. If you click, on, if you go to the microphone in the bottom left corner, there's a triangle button, triangle menu to the right of the microphone. If you click on that, um, and then there's there's a menu right through from the bottom that says switch to phone audio. If you can gotcha. switch to that and then call in. Can we, um, you want to move on to Joe for now while I deal with this or? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Sure. Um, all right. So for those guys um, who had a little uh, difficult time hearing what uh, Dave was saying, um, one distinction we really need to make is between um, bias incidents and hate crimes, as you can see on the screen. Um, every instance where, um, uh, you have sort of an interaction uh, with the public that could be based on your race and it could be a negative interaction. Uh, usually the touch point is gonna have to come down to some type of threat of uh, either some type of touching or, uh, I, actually it's really useful to go directly to the statute. Dave, I don't know if you have the aggravated harassment statute uh, that we can put up. But uh, the, uh, the, so in New York, there's essentially what's referred to as the hate crime law. 
And the hate crime laws is a bit of a misnomer because uh, it 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 makes it makes the it makes it seem like the hate crime law is like you can violate it by doing X or doing Y or doing Z. That's that's actually not how the hate crime law in uh, New York works. It's a it's a sentence enhancer. So what that means is if you've already committed a crime against a person, then if it can be proven that the motivation was uh, substantially based on a perception about that person's race, then the amount of punishment that you would receive is higher. So for example, um, an assault three, when it, that occurs when, uh, in, in the typical scenario, when someone actually physically assaults you and causes uh, physical injury to you on purpose, normally that's a misdemeanor. But if we can prove that it was based on um, a perception regarding your race, then at that point, it's going to be elevated to a felony. Um, so the, the real question is, in terms of when we're looking at these statutes, that, that was the hate crime statute. That's the 48505. The statute I, I really would like you guys to um, take a look at is, um, and hold on, let me see if I can pull it up over here. Uh, it's, uh, it's called aggravated harassment in the second degree. This is, uh, uh, there's a number of different ways you can commit it, but the one that's really important to us is uh, in subsection three. And that section reads that um, a person's guilty of that when with the intent to harass, annoy, threaten, or alarm another person, he or she strikes, shoves, kicks, or otherwise subjects that other person to physical conduct or to physical contact or attempts or threatens to do the same because of a belief or perception regarding such person's race, color, national origin, ancestry, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a few things there uh, that makes this particular statute important. First of all, um, as Dave said, uh, threats alone, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, words alone usually, typically, uh, would not be an arrestable offense, right? So to the extent that you know somebody walking down the street says to you, you know, I'm going to punch you in your face. And the, uh, and the circumstances of the manner in which they said it could prove that it was with the intent to harass, annoy, threaten, or alarm you. Um, typically, that's not something that someone would get arrested for. Uh, but because that's called harassment second. Now, add one element to that, that they're threatening you based on a perception, right? Their personal perception about who you are, right? So to the extent they, they say like, you know, I'm gonna knock you out because of COVID or I'm gonna knock you out, you Chinese people caused all this, right? So then you have the two things, you have the threat of physical violence and uh, you have that it was based on a perception about your race. Now the perception about your race element is kind of important because uh, what's, what's really important to note here is that they don't have to be right, right? So like I, I spent most of my life, well, I grew up in Maryland, but I spent a large part of my life being called Chinese. Um, and to the extent that that happens now, um, in, in my case, that would actually uh, that'd be partially accurate, but uh, I'll get into that later. Uh, I'm, I'm Korean, ethnically Korean, but really the element there is that it has to be a perception, right? So if, if they believe you to be one thing or another, um, and you can show from the, the things that they said or did, that uh, what did to uh, on the fact that you know you are some type of fit within this statute. So a us, um, us being able to show that it was based on a, a belief about your race or ethnicity gets you to the level of a crime when normally it wouldn't be. Now um, a, a, another instance, another instance where that that becomes important is that um, when uh, so there's the perception of who you are that affects uh, whether or not they can charge you uh, crime. But usually police officers um, don't really deal with this statute, right? So this statute um, has been extremely rarely charged. And as a result, to the extent that uh, someone were to give a report that said, for example, uh, you know, I was, I was threatened. They, they threatened me with physical harm and, you know, they said it was because they thought it was Chinese and I started this whole thing. Well, uh, it's actually pretty reasonable for a police officer to say like, well, you know, did he, 
did he touch you? Was there, did you suffer any injuries? And the reason why they would go through that inquiry is because normally in, in almost every other scenario, that's essentially uh, the inquiry that you would go through, right? You're not gonna arrest in normal circumstances when one person threatens another person. But um, this particular statute is important that, that, that we educate the public on, that they know that threats actually can rise to the level of crimes where a person can be arrested. Um, and there, there are a number of, of different um, prescriptions that we have if you do rise well, all right, Joe, I can take over. Sorry about so, that. We good, Joe? Uh, hey, is Dave back? We got you? Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about Hello? that. Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, great. Fantastic. Sorry about that. I apologize. I had to uh, swap to a different well, than, I mean, different computer than I normally use because the kids are on everything. <laughs> All right, so uh, as we were saying, you know, there are, the vast majority of the hate crimes are not, I mean, these five incidents are going to be hate crimes because hate crimes generally require either harm or the threat of harm. You know, all incidents, though, we really want you to report it because if we're not, re if things aren't being reported, we are not going to really be able to do anything about them. And, you know, it's not until there are significant numbers of reports that, you know, action gets taken. Now, um, whenever possible, you want to record all incidents, what, however you can, right? So, and I, I, I need to let you know, I understand that sometimes, you know, in the middle of incidents, the first thought is to pull out your phone and start recording. But there are certain things that you can do to start recording more easily uh, than others. Um, now, as an assailant leaves, sometimes you don't think to record or pull out your phone until they're walking away from you. But take a video of that person as you're leaving so you can at least have a clear record of what the person looks like, what they were wearing, um, anything that's going to help you in that case. Because if you don't have that information, it's just going to make everything harder. Um, and now, be prepared to record. Um, I just tested, okay, if you say, okay, Google, take a video of this. What will happen is you'll open up your camera and it'll be open to the video setting. You just hit the record button and it'll start. Um, you know, I'm sure Siri can do the same thing. My Sony phone, I, I have because it has a special camera button. Um, and just, you know what, N knowing that incidents can happen, it's always good to have something you can start recording immediately. Um, now, the language being used is going to be very specific. Um, it, it's very important to be specific specific about the language used, and we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, now, we talked about the, the prosecution of hate crimes, and we talked about the law a little bit already, but evidence includes your own experience. What you heard, what you saw, um, what happened to you, what you felt, all of that constitutes evidence, particularly when you're going to be called, if you get called to testify. And that means you have to report and you have to be cooperative if you want something done. But that a lot of people say, oh, I didn't record anything, I didn't have anything. Well, yeah, it's not the best, but in fact, evidence, your own experience alone is going to constitute evidence. Now, um, even better evidence obviously includes witnesses, photos, video, and audio, right? Anything. If, if you, let's say you, you start the video recording and you still have the camera down in your hand, you don't get anyone's face, but you're getting the words that are being said. You're hearing like, you know, if someone's getting you know, like the sounds of a scuffle, every, all of that is important evidence that could be useful in a prosecution of a case. Um, the thing about a hate crime is unlike most crimes, uh, a successful prosecution requires it to prove the motive, okay? Normally when I prosecute some, a case, I would have to prove a state of mind, that somebody intended to do something, but not necessarily why they intended to do something. So if I, you know, usually certain things, uh, the intent is relatively clear, you know, a gunshot to the head, generally that's clear that that was an intentional act. But on the other hand, why, what was the underlying reason for the intentional act? That usually is something that I don't need to prove. It's something that's helpful uh, in getting conviction, but it's not a necessary element. When we charge something as a hate crime, it's going to require us to prove motive. Now, the language used, the situation, 
the location, the appearance of the victim and the perpetrator may all be factors that come into play when we're talking about whether or not something is a hate crime, right? We have to use these outward uh, observations to help us prove what was going on inside the mind of the person who was committing the act. Now, um, the, the statute that we're talking about that um, aggravated harassment in second degree, degree that Joe was really focusing on is, a, is one of the few things that doesn't require some actual harm, okay? And that's what's very important because a lot of the incidents that are being reported are incidents where there's no actual harm. There's no physical injury, no damage to property. And when I say physical injury, it's in the le very legal sense of the physical in injury. Normally, you know, if I got a bruise or a cut on my face, I say, hey, I got injured. But the courts now say that in order to have physical injury, it's a much, much higher level, okay? I mean, there are times when they say a broken orbital bone may not be uh, enough for physical injury. So just keep that in mind. So a person is guilty of aggravated harassment in the second degree when, with the intent, so here is the key, the intent to har harass, annoy, threaten, or alarm another person, he or she strikes, shoves, kicks, or otherwise subjects a, another person to physical contact or attempts or threatens to do the same. So this is where here you actually don't require physical contact. The attempt or threatening to do those things is enough to qualify for this crime. And now, so that part, that first part of up to, you know, without this, oops, sorry. This part here normally is just harassment in the second degree. And that's a violation. And the thing about this is this alone, a police officer cannot make an arrest unless if they actually observed it because it's a violation. Uh, under our law, police officers can only make an arrest for a violation if they personally observe. Now, they can, they can write a summons, but they can't make an arrest. Now, once we add this, okay, the motive because of a belief or perception regarding such person's race, color, national origin, ancestry, gender, religion, religious practice, age, disability, or sexual orientation, regardless of whether the belief or perception is correct, that once we can add that there's this proof of this other part, this motive, then it becomes an A misdemeanor, which means the penalty is up to a year in jail, and it's a crime. Once it becomes a crime, a police officer can make an arrest even though they did not actually observe it. As Joe was saying, though, normally the police officers are just thinking this, okay? They're thinking, oh, we just, it's just normal harassment in the second degree. So you have to really be clear about, no, this actually, uh, there's proof, and I have proof, you know, it helps a lot if you can say, I have proof that it was race-based, that it was because this person thought I was a Okay, so the next part of the, uh, the law that we need to discuss is the actual hate crime law. As Joe was saying, the hate crime law is actually very general, and it is a, something that we use to add or increase the penalties on a normal other existing offense. So a person commits a hate crime when he or she commits a specified offense. Okay, Re remember that term, specified offense. And either intentionally selects the person against whom the offense is committed or intended to be committed, okay? So I'm picking this person because that, girl, that person looks Chinese to me. In whole or substantial part because of a belief or perception because of regarding the race, color, and uh, national origin, ancestry, gender, religion, religious practice, age, disability, or sexual orientation of a person, regardless of whether the book belief or perception is correct. So I'm not Chinese, someone thinks I'm, I'm Chinese, like Joe said, that would still qualify as a hate crime. Or intentionally commits an act or acts constituting the offense in whole or substantial part because of a national uh, belief uh, or perception regarding the race, color, national origin, et cetera, okay? So now that means I committed, it wasn't so much that I selected this person that way, but in fact, I just decided I was gonna do this because of this person's race, okay? 
Now, specified offenses. What are the specified offenses? Well, like, as I say, it usually requires the injury or the threat of injury or the destruction of property. Okay, this is really important to understand. It, again, terms where it's like, hey, listen, chink, get out of here, right? That's not yet a hate crime. It requires that. If you tell someone, hey, get out of here, Asian guy, because, you know, or I'm going to beat the shit out of you, excuse the language, but that is when you're going to have something because there is a threat of an injury, okay? So that becomes that aggravated harassment in the second degree, all right? But now, w there's a long list of se specified offenses, all right? Um, it includes assault where someone actually is injured, right? Menacing is where someone is with physical menace, meaning maybe they have a knife or they even saying, they, feel, they bring their fist up and say, I will, I'm really gonna hurt you, get out of here. That would be menacing. Stalking, stalking is repeatedly following somebody, uh, putting them in fear of their, uh, their physical uh, safety. Uh, reckless endangerment, which is, uh, as you can imagine, Strangulation, harassment in the first degree, which again is a course of conduct where you're continuing to harass somebody. Um, sexual abuse and sexual assault, unlawful imprisonment, kidnapping and coercion, criminal trespass, which is entering upon somebody's property, um, not necessarily within a building, burglary is entering someone's building, criminal mischief is damaging people's personal property. So let's say that, uh, one of the incidents involves somebody's phone being damaged. That was a criminal mischief case of a hate crime. Um, arson, who is burning somebody's property. Uh, larceny, stealing, uh, and robbery, which is forcible stealing. And any attempt or conspiracy to commit any of those above offenses. Now, the, the little asterisk means that not all subdivisions of all of these crimes may qualify as specified offenses. I know it's a little long list, but uh, that's how the legislature made it out. What's the effect of a hate crime conviction? Well. There's an increase in possible penalties. Normally, there are uh, mis felonies, misdemeanors, and violations, which are handled by a criminal court. Uh, violations generally have a penalty of 15 days of jail or less maximum. Um, then misdemeanors can go from B, felon B misdemeanors and A misdemeanors, and then there's felonies A, B, C, D, and E felonies. All of that's a little bit over everyone's heads. The idea is really when, if, when we charge, when a prosecutor's office charges an incident as a hate crime, it increases the possible penalties um, that a defendant can, can receive. Now, obviously, there's a social stigma. If someone's being conv convicted of a hate crime, there's going to be a social stigma against that. Um, and there may be possible mandated, mandated sensitivity training. But I need you to remember. Recent changes in criminal law mean lower penalties and a much less like a much lower likelihood that people are going to be held on in jail pending trial. So that's those are the things that we need to consider. The, as we get to this, I really want uh, everyone to keep in mind what I said. It's very important to record and report. All right, those are the real keys. All right, uh, spitting on a victim—that's a great question. Um, that case can qualify within the aggravated harassment because it's subjecting someone to uh, the physical contact, all right? It may not, it's not necessarily contact between persons, but you are putting something onto that person that they don't want. Um, what motivated the recent changes in lower penalties? That's generally, um, there's a lot of criminal, uh, criminal justice advocates right now who made a significant, significant inroads in changing public opinion. So, um, Eugene? Yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, um, well, that was a question about coughing on the victim. That would be a very, very hard uh, case. I don't think that that would be something that would qualify for a prosecution. All right. Okay, thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> well, I think there's one more question coming in right here. Uh, okay, so like we said, what if they don't say the word Asian and they say, what if they, they say go back to your country? I think that's a great question. I think that really, uh, reality, it, it generally is going to be something su sufficient enough that, again, they, that it is likely to qualify as the aggravator harassment. 
Um, but it was, again, a much harder case for a prosecutor to try. Okay, uh, so uh, we have a few more questions, but we'll try to address them at the end uh, uh, at our Q&A. So thank you, David. And um, Joe, uh, uh, if you can uh, lead your discussion. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, so I'm gonna speak a little bit about, actually, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the connection. You guys hearing me okay? I hear you fine right now. <laughs> Great. Okay, so, um, one thing we wanted to discuss, and Dave, Dave sort of bleeds into itself, is that we wanted to talk a little bit about um, what to do in terms of preserving the case and, and having the best case possible. So one thing that was mentioned, obviously, uh, to record if it's possible, uh, video recording, if you have a cell phone, that's really, really important. Um, you need to be able to prove that this person said whatever it is they said, otherwise, you know, it's gonna be one account versus another person. You also got to remember that um, recording it and being able to publicize it is a really important aspect of what's going on right now because I think people are inclined to not believe that this is happening. Um, I know in our community, we certainly believe that it's happening, but the, the model Asian perspective, I, I think, does cast a lot of doubt on whether or not this is actually occurring to the degree that people are seeing it. In fact, uh, the police department has only a, a number of reported cases, um, and that's a, that's a huge that's a much larger discussion than I think we can go into right here. What is really important is that we get um, is that we get these recordings, that we get a prosecutable case. And what's going to be important to that is if you have a recording, uh, also remember, if you call 911, that entire call is going to be recorded as well. So if, you know, it's easier for you or you're in a position to dial 911 and that's all you can do and like not necessarily talk to the operator, but talk to the other person, that's still something that we can, or just hold it up to them, that's something that we can retrieve later on. Those things do get recorded and that's important. So um, one aspect is getting a recording if possible. The other thing is a lot of the times when these things happen, I, I know we've been keeping some statistics on it, not, not us personally, but there, there are some nonprofit organizations that are trying to keep statistics on this, is that a lot of the times there are, um, there are bystander witnesses who see what's going on and sometimes step in. It's really, really important that you get their information. It's, it's good to get, um, you know, if you have witnesses with you, um, but it's much more important for us to get accounts from uh, people who are not affiliated with you. Uh, the law, and as you can understand, you know, even as a lay juror, you're more likely to believe someone who has no skin in the game, um, you know, has no bone to pick, and especially if somebody steps in. And the last thing you're thinking when an incident happens like this is, oh, you know what, let me get their name and number. Well, that's really important, and the police may not do that, right? Patrol's job, those are the folks that usually respond to these emergency-type situations. They, uh, first of all, they may not wait for the police to show up, right? So you're going to want their information just so that you can collect it and, and maybe get in touch with them later. You need someone to back up your side of the story. All right, the next thing is that I definitely wanted to address was what do you do if you are a bystander? If you see something like this happening, um, a lot of our recordings actually come from uh, people who are not involved in the incident, people who are witnessing the incident. Well, um, the same sort of things apply. Like you being able to record the incident is a huge help. Um, you being able to call the police and have them come and arrest this individual is a huge help. You know, a lot of the victims of these crimes, as were mentioned, and a large percentage of our population in New York are people who don't speak English as their native language, or may even be illiterate, or may be distrustful of the police um, and law enforcement. So it's really important that you, uh, to the extent that you're able to safely um, preserve this information, you be that eyewitness, you take that recording. Uh, now, one thing that came, came up during a, a previous webinar was, um, there was this thought that, well, you know, if the person who's being harassed isn't willing to go forward or doesn't stick around or something like that, then the case sort of disappears. And that, that's actually not true. Uh, we can absolutely, uh, it's, it's a tougher, it's a more sort of nuanced and complex case, but in some ways it could be better than a witness alone for an eyewitness to have a recording of the entire incident. Um, you can't really fight the video. This actually happened. And really, 
what is penalized here is not so much its effect on the person that's being aggravated harassed. The issue here is going to be what the person committing the crime is thinking and doing. So to the extent that you have recordings of the words being said, uh, the way that he's approaching the other person, and also, you know, to the extent that you're telling him to stop, his reactions or her reactions to you are going to evince what their intent is. They may not go up to a person and say, you know, get the F out of here, you, you know, effing this or that or whatever it is. But to the extent that you see what's going on and they're being physically threatened or spat on and you come up with a camera and you're like, hey, what, why are you doing that to that guy? And they see you and they're like, because you people should go back to your country. Well, guess what? Now that's a prosecutable case. Now that person's going to get arrested. And now that's something that, uh, you know, our community needs because we know this is happening. We know this is happening on a regular basis, but we need, uh, we need reporting, we need more reporting, and we need better quality reporting, reporting that can result in arrests. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the process too. So the whole process really just starts with um, alerting the police, right? So incident occurs, thing happens, you've preserved your evidence, right? The next thing that's gonna happen is that you have to make a report. Now that can happen by calling 911. That can happen by going to the precinct. Some contact between you and uh, law enforcement, whatever that's going to be. Now, once that report gets generated within um, New York City, there's a standard form called a 61. It's a complaint report, and um, police are obligated to make a complaint report for any crimes uh, that are reported to them. So this dovetails into what Dave was telling you before about how you know a threat plus the fact that you're Asian makes it then uh, something that is a crime that can be reported. So once the crime gets reported and the 61 gets generated, um, that if they don't make an arrest right away, then that gets uh, sent to a detective squad to follow up and investigate and try to arrest this person. Now, in the two uh, bias incidents that, uh, you know, that I'm aware of that were, um, that received some press attention, uh, in both of those cases, the individual wasn't arrested at the scene, police did not arrive at the scene, it was actually a report was made, and then a detective was assigned and, and they sent out, you know, video or pictures of the person who did it and asked for tips from the public, and then they went out to go try and arrest this individual. Well, that, um, you know, that happened in those two cases. They were highly publicized. PD is going to be motivated to try to get these people, but that happened because of the first steps that I had mentioned, the recording, the photographs. There was something to distribute that we could go back and look for. The next thing um, that, that um, happens after you make your report, investigation happens, uh, is hopefully there's an arrest. And once an arrest occurs, um, then the person gets arraigned and it gets handed off to the prosecutors, which is what uh, me and David are. And we are the individuals who are going to then marshal the case through, um, through the court system. It may end up in a trial. It may end up in uh, some type of disposition. There's a lot of different things that happen. Uh, but we just wanted to give you a general overview of sort of the steps um, that it's going to go down. And we also wanted to highlight to you uh, one important factor that you should consider. Um, and uh, this is this is something that's that's recent. Starting this year, uh, we've been uh, we have a very accelerated disclosure um, obligation. Now, what does disclosure obligation mean? That means that. Uh, Basically, most of the information that the police department provides to us needs to be turned over to defense counsel. So the person representing um, this hate crime individual is going to get a copy of the police paperwork, which um, will, of course, include an accounting of what happened, and it will include um, contact information for you, which uh, should not include your address, and uh, most often, actually, as I understand it, all the city offices at least, we're only obligated to turn over a meaningful contact, um, and that has to happen within a certain period of time. So to the extent that you guys have emails, and if everyone's on this Zoom, obviously they have emails, it would be a working email address that we would turn over. We won't turn over your phone number, we won't turn over your address, but your name would be turned over. And, and quite frankly, that, that might be an important thing that we would wanna do anyway, because we would want to get what's called an order of protection 
so that if this individual and you, let's say you live in the same, um, you know, apartment complex or in the same neighborhood and, you know, there's a reason why you would have to see this individual again, they would get in um, a lot of trouble for even talking to you, not threatening you, even coming up to you and saying like, hey, look, I'm sorry, they could technically be arrested for that as well. So we can't get an order of protection if we don't give them your name. So that's, that's also something, um, you know, probably that would happen during the course of uh, us arraigning the case and processing it. So you should be aware that that type of stuff is going to happen. If there is an arrest, all of this is going to be gone over uh, by a prosecutor with you. Obviously, we're going to take the steps that, that we're legally able to, to protect you and keep you safe. The last thing we want to do is expose you to further harm. But what's really important is that we're only going to be able to make inroads into what's going to happen, um, how our you know, family members, how our children are going to be treated in public uh, if we can get these reports, if we can make these arrests, and if we can have successful prosecutions against people who are, say, spitting on people because of COVID. Um, or, you know, somehow manifesting a crime that we can follow up on. So uh, those are some things we wanted to mention. The last thing that's really, really important is this is a crime of words. Aggravated harassment is a crime of words. The hate crime statute is a crime, for the most part, of words. We need to be able to prove what that person was thinking, or at least try to prove what that person was thinking. And for us to do that, it's gonna man, it can't be like I'm the only Asian person in the room and I don't know him and he harassed me. Um, that may be the reason why, I mean, it probably could be, or, you know, based on your race that they're harassing you. But my obligation is to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they were substantially motivated by it. And for that, I'm gonna need them to have said something that indicates uh, why they're doing what they're doing. And you know, quite frankly, these, defendants, these perpetrators, they want people to know that this is why they're doing it. And they want, especially in the case of Asian Americans, um, they definitely feel a certain sense of impunity. I, th I think we're living in a certain time. I think we're also dealing with a certain segment of the population that's dealing with fear and they're going to displace it a certain way. And they're going to want to make it clear like, hey, look, it's you because of this reason. And um, to the extent that they say that you need to get the wording exactly right. It can't be something along the lines of, it can't be, oh, you know, about some in substance, I think is usually something that prosecutors use. I'm telling you right now, I prosecuted um, an aggravated harassment case um, for an incident that occurred on Staten Island during the Gay Pride Parade. And um, we got a conviction for all of the stuff that he did, but I was unable to prove that he did it based on the fact that they were gay. And there were two reasons that it was complicated. Number one, um, some of the evidence that you have to put forward is like terrible stereotypical stuff. You have to show that, hey, look, look at this picture. They're flamboyant or something along those lines. You have to be able to display that a, a, a lay person would come to the conclusion that this person is within whatever category it is. But number two, which is more important, is that the witnesses in this case, said totally different things when they were asked, you know, like, what did he say? And everyone had sort of a different response, which you would sort of expect. But it was to such a degree that the jury was left with, I don't, you know, I mean, one of the witnesses got up there and said, you know, I, it was something along the lines of, so when an incident occurs right after the incident, you will remember exactly what was said if it wasn't recorded. Whatever that is, and whatever was not on the recording, the thing that precipitates the video usually is not on the video. Whatever that was, you need to distill it into an exact phrase of what happened, the quotes that you remember, and write it down somewhere. And that is going to be your record. No matter what happens, this is what happened. Okay? And whatever that is, um, try not to omit anything important because any omission on that writing, whatever it is, is going to be treated as, well, you didn't say it there and now you're saying X, Y, or Z. So those are two things that I think are really important. The next thing that's really important is every time you retell the story, 
if you're posting it on social media, if you're talking to the press, anything like that, all of those different versions are going to be used later to discredit what it was that you've said. So generally speaking, prosecutors advise, um, you know, witnesses to crime not to give interviews, not to speak to the press, specifically because of that reason. Um, but so those were some of the pointers we wanted to point out to you. Also, as, as people that are, um, you know, assisting other people with making reports, it's also important that, you know, you be accurate with what it is that you're saying. And also, now that we've gone through the law with you, um, it's, it's important that you um, not be perceived as sort of shaping their testimony one way or the other. So if they tell a full accounting of the story and, and they're like, oh, but, but what did they say about, you know, your race? That's perfectly fine. But they're, and I point to the Vincent Chin homicide. Uh, to those of you who are familiar with it, there was a, a, a case specifically where this issue came up and um, there were groups that were trying to assist the witnesses during the course of the trial to make sure that they could prove that it was a race-based motivation. And their prep sessions ended up basically killing the prosecution um, because they would do things like, hey, look, we got to, you know, can we phrase that a different way? We have to do this. We don't do anything like that. Leave it to the professionals to speak to the witnesses. If it happens to you, make sure you have a recording or make sure you write down whatever it was that happened. Uh, but those are those are the general outlines of the things that we wanted to make sure that we spoke to you about. Thank you, Joe. That was very helpful. Um, um, next, so we have Julia. Hi. Um, so as David and Joe have been uh, talking about, um, it, it's obviously very important to report these incidents. Um, you can report them to law enforcement and uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, it, it's important for, for a lot of reasons. Obviously, it, it can provide the, the evidence that can be used um, by police to identify the, uh, the criminal or the person responsible for the incident. Um, and, and it can be used to identify whether a crime even occurred because, you know, as David and Joe have explained, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into um, determining whether an incident rises to the level of, of being a hate crime. Um, and uh, it's also important to, to report these incidents, whether you experience it or, or you witness it, um, because, you know, you have this firsthand information that the police might not have if, if they're obviously not on the scene. You can let them know um, you know, what the perpetrator looked like, what they did and what they said. Um, and it can also be used uh, in civil claims uh, by victims of anti-Asian harassment and violence um, in order to recover damages and, and to help change policies. And uh, reporting these crimes can also help prevent future crimes and bias incidents. Um, if the police and the community know what's going on, uh, they can help to educate and inform and protect the other people um, in the area. And you, not everybody feels comfortable going to the police, um, and that's okay, or, or maybe what you've witnessed or experienced uh, isn't a hate crime and is a bias incident. You can report these to non-governmental organizations, and it's really important to do so because they, um, they collect this data, which helps them try to understand what the problem is and what's going on in the community and, and how to protect um, other Asians from experiencing these uh, terrible events. Um, and they can also help put together resources, um, provide other services to the Asian community and, and fight for policy changes. Uh, so there's actually quite a few places where you can go and, and report um, these incidents and, and hate crimes. Um, a lot of these contact informations, information should be available in Avani's uh, Know Your Rights document on this. Um, in an emergency, if, if you are experiencing or you witness a hate crime uh, currently in progress, it's always just best to call 911 so the police can come and help uh, right away. Um, for a non-emergency situation, there, there's a lot of governmental, non-governmental organizations. Um, New York State and New York City uh, have hate crime task forces and human rights agencies that you can report incidents and hate crimes to. Um, victims can apply comp for compensation through them and for other assistance. 
Uh, in New York City, if you witness or experience an incident on the MTA, you can also make a report to an MTA hotline. Um, and uh, in New York City or the New York metro area, you can also report the hate crimes to your local district attorney, which all have uh, hate crimes task forces um, that you know, can provide you additional information or um, you, know, you can file your official report with them. Um, and then, like I stated earlier, there's a lot of non-governmental organizations if you don't feel comfortable going to the police or um, if you experienced or witnessed a bias incident that is not a hate crime. So these can include um, contacting ABNY or the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, uh, NAFABA, Communities Against Hate, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Um, you can make reports to them in Chinese, Korean, or Vietnamese. Um, Equality Watch, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Anti-Defamation League. Um, when reporting to the non-governmental organizations, uh, it's just important to keep in mind that this is not the same as uh, reporting these incidents to the police. Uh, these organizations mostly collect data, provide resources and other services. Um, a lot of these governmental and non-governmental groups also have uh, a variety of resources on their websites about hate crimes and what constitutes a hate crime or what constitutes a bias incident um, and uh, you know, other information about COVID-19 and anti-Asian incidents. Um, something else I wanted to point out is that um, in New York City, your immigration status does not prevent you from reporting hate crimes or receiving essential services. So, you know, don't let that um, scare you in, into, uh, into not reporting if you've experienced an incident or you've witnessed something. Um, in New York, or sorry, New Jersey and Connecticut also have uh, similar resources, um, which should be contained in the uh, Know Your Rights document as well. Um, the, uh, there's also the New York Attorney General's Office uh, that you can contact and file a report with um, to launch a civil investigation, um, and they can also provide you with other resources. Okay, thank you, um, Julia, and thank you to our other two panelists, David and Joe, for participating. Um, we had a few questions. Um, yeah, Eugene, would it, would it be all right if I, re there's a, um, there's a YM and a Jasmine Lee who wrote some um, sort of important questions I just wanted to address briefly, if that's all right? Yeah, sure, go ahead. All right, so YM um, asked whether or not um, bystanders should report. I had a pretty extensive section. I think they're probably going to make a recording of this, so if you want to watch it again, you can see it. But yes, absolutely, bystanders should report, um, even if the complainant is unknown and not reporting. Uh, you can initiate the complaint on your own. It's really important that you do so, and the case may actually be stronger, especially if you have video of the incident. The next thing that was asked by YM was if there are uh, sort of corroborating videos or stuff from social media or other people seeing this individual doing stuff, is that something that would be helpful? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, to the extent that that gets to the uh, detective who's doing the investigation or to the prosecutor who's who's going through the incident, then that can be helpful too. So, you know, maybe nothing was said at the scene um, or there was something that was colorable said at the scene, but basically there's like a Twitter feed that says going out hunting, you know, yellow people today or something like that. You know, that's really helpful. That tends to prove that this is in fact um, you know, a bias incident. So all that stuff is really important. And also there was uh, something posted um, asking, uh, I can't remember who, Jasmine. Jasmine posted asking, does it make sense to report to a prosecutor's office versus going to these NGOs? Um, I'm just gonna say this, uh, the statistics that are kept by the city are the ones that they respond to. It's kind of like, um, you know, is it all right if I do all this other stuff, but I don't, but I don't, you know, fill out my census form. I mean, it's all right. Like, I'm not going to say you don't do it, but at the same time, if you're not on the census form, you don't exist. So to the extent that a report is not being made to NYPD, that's not something that they're following up on. That's not something that the NGOs can follow up on. And that's sort of further, um, further fuel that certain individuals can use to say, like, we don't have a problem. Look, we don't have these statistics. 
these things aren't happening. So if you're in a situation where, like, let's say you have a recording of harassment, but you're not sure whether that rises to the level of a crime, uh, definitely make that report because those decisions about what is and is not a crime, what is and is not going to be prosecuted, um, are going to be made later. And you know what? They can be revisited. And there's stuff that we can find out that you guys can't do on your own, right? Like you may not be able to find all this background information on the defendant, and maybe we can. So to the extent that, um, you know, should you just go with the NGOs, I would suggest doing both. Um, but I would definitely say the sooner you report to the police department, the better. I would add to that um, very much. This is really is one of the most important things. The general feeling is, man, if I report, the police aren't going to do anything. Right. That is really one of the most common, like thinking, uh, you know, crazy you hear that from people. And I, I'll tell you, to be honest, it might be true with the first report or the second report. But when the reports pile up, that's when the police are forced to do something. When, the, when you say, oh, I'm not going to bother reporting. And then you say, well, the police didn't do anything about something I didn't report. Of course, they didn't do anything about any of your report. And so you have to absolutely positively report these things. And so report to the police. And as I said, if the, more, the, the cases where you don't have sufficient evidence, maybe they're going to be reluctant to take a report. I, I, I'm going to caution everybody. If you want somebody to do something for you, right, even though it's their job, it will always be easier if you are polite about it and but insistent, okay? That's really one of the things. Um, a question was, if someone's not really saying, you know, the officer's like, listen, I don't really know if I'm going to, you know, and I'm like, and they start to tell you they're not going to, you're not going to take a report. Then you said, listen, if uh, you're not going to take the report, I'm going to go to the precinct and I'm going to have to sit there and take the report. And then they'll ask me why I didn't take, why I didn't report it sooner. And what I'll tell them is I was with officer so-and-so and he didn't want to take the report. It's going, it's that, I, I mean, and that's really one of the ways you do that, okay? And so that's going to be helpful, I think. Uh, it, again, a very good, non, non, non overly assertive way, but still at the same time saying, listen, I'm making this report no matter what, okay? Now, a couple questions with regard to self defense, okay? Now, the law on self defense in New York is that when you, when a person reasonably believes, that someone else is going to use physical force against them or Im imminently use that physical force against them, they can also respond with physical force. Now, physical force doesn't mean deadly physical force, right? So you can't, if someone's going to punch you, you can't use a bat and, or a knife. Um, pepper spray and tasers are kind of on that borderline, and I would, I would highly, highly recommend not using pepper spray. Uh, pepper spray is a huge... A lot of collateral damage with that, okay? If you spray it, everyone around you is getting affected, so please avoid using your pepper spray. It really isn't a good idea. Um, but those, you know, as far as the law goes, that's really you know, the real key. Uh, the thing is, and again, in the city, uh, we just, uh, I just got the latest stats recently, and there, as I, I put online, that there have been about 20 incidents involving co um, Asian in hate crimes, 17 COVID-related and three other Asian um, hate crimes, okay? Now, one of the things about that is, like, let's say the incident, there's a Brooklyn incident where it's, it's, uh, acid was poured on a woman, okay? That may not be charged as a hate crime even, even if they catch the person because it's really unclear why it happened. Okay, that's really the biggest difficulty about, as we said, is proving something is a hate crime. It's a crime if that person still should be punished, but getting that elevated level of a hate crime can be difficult because if nothing is said, if there is no reason to, to really prove. And again, we have to not just prove, oh, most likely, we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that was the motive for that crime. Okay, and so that's, that's really one of the problems with these things. There's some questions about whether, what if they don't say anything? It, again, it, if they say nothing, it, it's going to be a lot harder.
to make charges of hate crime because we don't really understand what was going on in the person's head. That's why the words, that, any words that are said, whether by you or the other person, maybe the conversation you might be having, like just before the incident happens, if you're speaking in a foreign language, maybe that matters, okay? Like there have been cases where two men are walking out of a gay bar in their time, right? That could be charged with a hate crime because the circumstances lead you lead someone to believe that that is something that would likely to be a hate crime, okay? Well, again, we have to go beyond likely. Was it a hate crime beyond a reasonable doubt? We have to try and find that type of proof. And so that, again, the gay bar incident, there may have been other state factors, as I said, but the gay bar alone may be enough. But again, if you're walking out of a Chinese restaurant, is that sufficient? Because so many people coming out of a Chinese, could be coming out of a Chinese restaurant, it may not be enough. Again, it, it will help a lot to pay attention to what's actually being said. And again, I know it's very difficult in the midst of something happening to you. These aren't the thoughts that are going through your head. You're probably thinking, oh my God, I can't believe this person is doing this. I'm mad. I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. This is very typical. Okay. It's very typical for a victim to be nervous and to not be totally focused on what's happening. They're trying to escape and go, is there a way out of this? Um, that's normal. Okay. But what your reaction should be, start to pay attention to what's being said, what the person looks like, you know, and, and what are they saying? And I really do want to also keep in, in people keep in mind of non-judicial, I don't know if it's a punishment or consequences, okay? When you can, if you have a photograph of a person and you're able to put that, that photograph out, up on social media and think, this is a guy who did X, Y, and Z. So it, even though it's not a crime, a lot of that can have some negative effect on their work and things like that. You know, it's just like, just like there, there is an incident where there was somebody working for Lululemon or Lululemon, whatever they call it, and the guy was wearing a, 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 a T-shirt in bad taste, right? Um, that person lost his job. You know, they're, they're, you can, those are significant consequences, and sometimes more significant, significant consequences than what the criminal justice system is going to have for them right now. All right? Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Joe. Um, so uh, if anyone has any questions, um, you can contact us again at albanyclinic at gmail.com or you can call us at our hotline 516-690-7724. I put in the chat for everybody that um, for your convenience. Um, again, thank you for all our wonderful panelists, uh, all of our viewers and listeners, and to everyone that helped put this together. Um, we couldn't have done this without you. Um, I want everyone out there to know that you're not alone. If you need help, um, again, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We also have uh, extensive resources, as uh, Julia mentioned, on our website. Uh, we have like, um, more information on anti-Asian harassment and violence, um, testing, evaluation, treatment of COVID-19, immigration, housing, unemployment, small business loans, and other topics as well. And um, I guess in closing, I, I'd, I'd like to leave all of you with uh, the words of the late, great Yuri Kochiyama, who was a, an Asian American activist prominent in New York City. And her words are this, remember that consciousness is power. Consciousness is education and knowledge. Consciousness is becoming aware. It is the perfect vehicle for students. Consciousness raising is pertinent for power and be sure that power will not be abusively used be used for building trust and goodwill domestically and internationally. Tomorrow's world is yours to build. So once again, thank you all for tuning in. We wish you the best. Stay safe, stay healthy out there in New York City, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you very much, guys. Great to have everyone here. Thank you so much.